Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. We've got a sponsor for you this week. This week's episode is sponsored by Status. Status app lets you chat, browse, and transact on the Ethereum blockchain. Take control of your own private secure messaging, use dApps on mobile, and secure your assets. Download the app today where you get your mobile apps or at statusim slash get. That's statusim slash G-E-T. The Bitcoin podcast will also be in the TBP channel of the Status app to give out a little SMT and let you play around with its features and start chatting privately today. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Hashing It Out, a podcast where we talk to the tech innovators behind blockchain infrastructure and decentralized networks. We dive into the weeds to get at why and how people build this technology and the problems they face along the way. Come listen and learn from the best in the business so you can join their ranks. Hey guys, welcome back to Hashing It Out. I'm your host, Dr. Corey Petty, with my co-host, Colin Couchet. So what's up, everybody, Colin? What's up, everybody, Colin? What's up, everybody, Colin? Uh, today's yeah, today's real. episode. Every time, same shit, man. Same shit. I love this shtick, though. I mean, it. people people have actually walked up to me and gone, "Oh, you're what's up, everybody, Colin?" <laughs> yeah, okay, it's working. It's, you gotta All stick, right. you gotta stick with Consist- the shtick. It works. Consistency is key, man. You know, if you got a catchphrase, go with it. Uh, today's episode, we're bringing on Sir Tora. Uh, we have Mubis Akiv coming to explain every, the ins and outs of formal verification and how Sartora tries to um, apply that to smart contracts in the blockchain space. So, Muli, do the normal thing. Give us an introduction as to who you are, what Sartora is, and how you got kind of introduced into this space. Wonderful. So, I, I'm Muli Sagi. I'm academic from Tel Aviv University. My research area is formal methods, and I have contributed major techniques into this area. And uh, now, a, y- a year ago, uh, uh, together with a, a student, Sherry Grossman, we established a venture that is supposed to actually make formal verification available to every developer. And at the moment, we are, we are already doing it. And, and, and is it particularly aimed at any specific platform? Um, is it meant to be uh, useful across the board? Or are you currently a kind of, is it, first of all, is it is it available now? And who is it available for? It's available now. There is a demo on the website that everybody could use. But at the moment, this demo is for the Ethereum virtual machine. This is what we did at the moment. It could be used for other, for, for other, for other uh, 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 platform, but at the moment it's available for, for, for Ethereum users, Solidity users and Ethereum users. Okay, uh, th- th- there's a lot to dive in here. Um, first, I guess we've had quite a few people on the show in the past uh, discussing formal verification um, and the different like, semantic solvers that are available within the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, can you, but for those who haven't listened to those episodes, can you give us kind of the 101, the intro of what formal verification is and why it's needed within kind of smart contracting languages and like Ethereum virtual machine? Sure. So formal verification is the uh, art of proving that your program does what it's supposed to do. And it's, of course, useful for many domains. I've been working on avionic software and other software which is, which it is used. But in the, con- in the concept of a smart contract or cryptocurrency, it is, it is really ne- needed because banks have tremendous effect. And, and, and because the contracts are kind of immutable, once you have this bug, it's really hard to mitigate that bug. So that's what makes it really, really useful in this domain. And of course, the fact that this domain, people use smart contracts to manipulate assets, then the, these bugs, the bugs that we are finding are very, very valuable. And it's important to find these bugs before the contracts are deployed. Now, uh, go ahead, continue, sorry. Yeah, if you want, I could at certain point try to explain what we are doing different at this space, but maybe later. That's definitely one of the questions I, I plan on asking. Um, but like, I guess before we get into that, like, um, what's needed for someone to start using something like this? In my experience, a lot of people who are developing smart contracts don't even write specifications. So it's hard for them to figure out what they should be looking for in the first place. 
uh, people like I, I know a lot of projects and and people when they try to put things on the mainnet, they don't like and they they think about getting an audit. They don't even know how to approach auditors. So how can they approach using software like this? That's an ex- that's an excellent question. In fact, formal method is an area that has been around for a long time, and there's a lot of challenges in making formal methods to work. But the biggest challenge in formal verification is just knowing what your contract is supposed to do, and that's the biggest problem that you have when you work with formal verification. So what we do with our customer, we use kind of a network effect in a sense that we check properties that one customer give us actually against other customers. And when you approach us and you can see that if you download the demo, you can actually have a set of properties that you can start with. And then you add more and more specification. And and the interesting thing is that if your contract manipulates, for example, ERC token, then in fact, we know how to check it and we, we, there is no need for intervention. But if you have a more complex software that you are developing, you will need to, to write specification and you're absolutely right. Writing specification is very hard. It's sometimes harder than writing the program. Well, in my opinion, it should be done first before you write the program, but I'm, maybe I'm right. uh, a different in that case. What, but like, all right. Why is it why I mean, is it better than than just you know running a bunch of tests and and, and making sure your tests work? Because the idea is that the the smart the specification is first of all very high level and it gives an assurance of what is this contract is supposed to do. And the second is the the amount of coverage that you get. You really get a coverage that when you write this specification, you know that for example you cannot mint an unbounded token. You know some property, and this is important for developer. It's important for clients of Disco. And another thing which is useful in this case, it's useful in the when, when your software evolves. Because what happens is when you when you right now a new version of the software, you can share that the software adheres to the specification before the the contract is changed. So this allows you to actually de- develop faster. In the sense that what you every time you develop a new contract. You actually, and you change your code, you you can check that it fulfills the specific the specification. Okay, so I think that's at, at the at the lowest, at the maybe the highest layer. Um, a quick introduction as to kind of what you're doing at Sertoro is you're providing software for people to make sure that their smart contracts are doing what they're supposed to do, and it does it in a rigorous way as as advertised. My question is, uh, I guess the next one is. Um, there's quite a few projects that are currently available within the ecosystem, uh, K Framework, Manticore, uh, Mithril, uh, that provide formal verification. How is this differentiated? Okay, so that so if you see there's as as I mentioned, there's a lot of work in this space, both in smart contract and you you mentioned some of the the excellent project. So it sounds like there are different approaches and they, they are, they are, they are different between the level of automation and the guarantee that they give you. And this is sort of where, where it depends where you want to be. So the, for example, framework like K, it can give you a very, very high assurance, but it, it, it requires a lot of manual effort. Okay. It does. And, 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 and it's, it, it's even worse in the sense that every time you change your code, you actually have to redo it. Okay. And, 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 and framework like Mitril is almost automatic, but it gives you very low assurance. In fact, all the bugs that we find, they were not found with, with Mitril. And we want to give you sort of the best of both worlds. We want to actually make sure, and you can see that in the demo, that we do it in an automatic fashion, and still we give you the guarantee and we can actually prove things that were not proven by K so far. We have proved properties that will be very hard to prove with K. It's possible, but it will require reverse reverse efforts. So I'm just going to give the audience kind of a rundown. I just went through the demo on the call right now to take a look at the invertible smart contract and the invertible spec. And I got to say, it's clear and understandable. And I, that is the first time in my life I've ever looked at anything <laughs> formal verification and could say that. And what essentially the invertible smart contract does is it has a counter and two functions, increment and decrement. Um, and um, what the spec says is um, that... The increment function, uh, it has two rules that it defines, and it's got a literal um, uh, keyword called rule that you define the name of the rule. So it's like a variable. You say rule invertible, and it will make sure that um, in the 
case of uh, like, for instance, it has one rule that fails, but um, in the case of a vertible, that a uh, that a decrement followed by an increment should give the original value. Um, of course, you could also add another rule in there that says the opposite, but those should be equivalent. Um, and then that's got another. That. Hmm? You can add that if you want. Now it's not. Yeah, I can you literally add. I actually already played with it, so I I, I know you can. Um, and then uh, it's got this other other rule. And it's just two rules. It literally says rule is invertible and rule is monotone. So I guess that means monotonically increasing. Yep. Yeah. So um, for that particular rule, it just says that uh, every time you increment that the current value or the, pr the value you had originally is always uh, after the increment uh, greater than the current value. And it fails. And it fails for good reason because it has a buffer overflow error. So as soon as you go past 256 uh, you know, bits of, you know, incrementing, uh, it fails. And the cool thing is if I hit that start verification button in their demo, it happens immediately. Now, I'm not sure if that's like that in your actual product. Uh, it is, it is the, but you are running the actual product. And this is literally exactly what it does. So you are, you're going through all the verification. It doesn't take so time let's... to pre-compile or build the rules or anything like that. Yeah, so let me tell you two things which are important. Uh, one of them is, Going back to the previous question, if you compare us to K, K doesn't find bugs. We find many, many bugs. And the biggest value of formal verification is not the fact that you are proving that your program is correct, because the issue of correctness, as, as Corey says, it's a complicated thing. The biggest value of program, program verification is finding cases that, that your program violates your specification. And that's actually where you run. And the tool that you are running now is running on the code. But I don't want to scare you. The idea is that you, we only let you, if you are not our customer, we only let you to run on, on the contracts that, that are there because we don't want people to attack other people. If you are, so, so the idea is we want to make sure that we run this. So this could be, if we make it an open source, this could be a loaded gun. We don't want to do that. We, it's something that we have used. So I don't know if you look into the other spec, the spec of the bounded minting. That's, I think it's like the... Right, uh, uh, my mic is muted. No, no, I have not. I can look at that right now though, while you're talking. So the interesting thing there, we ran it against Maker. Maker is a big project and we found a huge bug that the auditor missed there. And it's actually, and it's a very interesting bug about this thing. The, one of the auditor found, and nobody found it so far with formal verification. So we found, so it's not that the, the, the computer automatically find these kind of bugs and that's very useful in this space. And if you run Mitril, it's a very, very rare bug. There's no way that you can find it by just guessing a, a single a single execution path or testing for that matter. But you are running the actual tool. So uh, a few things based on what you just said. Um, open sourcing the code, while could being a loaded gun, quickly rises the tide um, for everyone. Now... What it does is it makes it very easy to find vulnerable, exploitable contracts currently on mainnet. Um, but in the same in the same fashion, the people who are like the people who should be motivated to check for those things are the people who have value locked up in those smart contracts. Therefore, submitting bugs associated with them very quickly. I'd argue that it may be useful to have something like this that's more broadly available um, because. May, maybe because I'm, I'm I'm biased and I spend a lot of time in the Ethereum security community, uh, and I would be looking at these things myself. Like if this is available to me freely, I would be running it on every single thing that we do in a in a, in a, in a very automated fashion. But I can't say the same for most people because most people aren't writing specs or think about these things in a lot of ways. But when you start breaking things very quickly using tools that are available to you, um, and right now I'd say the people who are who are breaking things are a small subset of people that are knowledgeable enough to understand how to break things. If we widen that pool, that it 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 makes it less likely that people can still use the available like it it opens up the pool of people who can use the available tooling to find bugs and means that it's more it's more likely that those people are going to be beneficial to the community versus just people attacking it, right? Like does that, does that make sense? Like, I, I want these tools to be more available because right now the barrier of entry for finding these types of bugs is very, very, very high, which is why smart contract audits cost so much. 
that makes perfect sense, and you are making a, a valid point because the moment this technology will be mature, then you are saying that it will not be a loaded gun because everybody will use it, and even the developer will use it. So that they will, the, you are saying, if, if it would be available for all developer, it will make the world a better place. And we will de- we will definitely consider it at certain point. We are we we just started this company a year ago, and we want this technology also to be mature enough. So that it can be, if it runs large scale, it it must be mature enough. But we may open source or maybe open source part of it. You notice that it's almost open source in the sense that what you are, what it happens now, you are running the actual tool. You are running the actual tool. It's hosted on Amazon, and this called our call. So now in the demo, you are actually running our tool. Okay, so I, I did go through the bank thing, the the bank one. I'm not sure which one you were talking about, but I did just go through. Uh, Bank.sol, I, I, it added a new like tool to the, the tool chest with the invariance. It's very cool. Uh, the question I have to ask is, um, why does this work and other ones don't? Um, what is your key innovation here that enabled this to work better? Yeah, so, the, so first of all, we should acknowledge Formal verification is an undecidable problem in computer science. This means that there always a program that formal verification will fail. Being our tool, being K, because it's uh, one of the hardest problems in computer science. So this means that you can take a program for which every tool will fail, and this will remain forever, and nobody can solve it with a computer. But what we have done, we have done a huge effort in understanding the EVM and connected it with constraint solver and still a way, way to go. So the idea is that what we do, and we can talk about it if you want to deep, uh, more technically, we have actually, we are, we are coming with 30 years of experience in this space. So we know a lot of things in this space and we haven't implemented everything that we know. But we, we know a lot of things to do. And also I must admit, the smart contract is a very, very nice domain for formal verification because the contracts are not very big. If you are, are run a tool on Microsoft Word, it will not terminate. Yeah, I've, I've, okay. I've discussed this previously with other other people, um, both on and off the show, is that like the, like this is the, in my opinion, one of the best domains to try and use applicable formal verification because one, the programs, as you said, aren't very large. Um, they're not as complex as standard software, so searching the space of all possible execution paths is much more tractable. Um, in a sense that, like, uh, it's if you were to think about all of the possible things that can happen within a given smart contract system, um, that space of possibilities is much, much, much smaller than the blockchain ecosystem because it's limited by gas. Um, a lot of the things so, that you can do, and 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 the number of instructions that you that are possible, right? And so because of that, it makes it easier to actually search the entire space and give the guarantees that you want when using software like this. Is that is that pretty much the the, the right gist here? No, actually, it's the opposite. It's okay. interesting. So so the interesting thing for us, we never we ignore guess. We prove it for unbounded guess. For us, the biggest problem in formal verification, the way we do it, is not the guess. And actually, we, we I can show you that guess will not scale even on small guess because this thing. So what we do, we reason symbolically. We convert your program essentially into mathematical equation, and then we use constraint solver. So in fact, when you when we prove that your program is correct, it will be correct under un, unbounded guess. In fact, one of the most interesting thing in formal verification that you make the domain harder, you make the verification easier. For us, we are algorithmic people. We are interested in making sure that formal verification will terminate for our customer. And and it actually has nothing to do with how many passes. We never explicitly enumerate the passes. Okay. And that's the beauty of it, because these pass correlated. The bug that we find in a maker is a very, very rare bug. It's a bug that somebody uh, closed the auction too early. It's, it's a rare bug when you should see the maker team when they found it. And all the bugs we are finding now, another bug, the bugs that we are finding are very rare. And actually, you can you can try to run it. So the, the, the issue of formal verification is that the code size is small, not the number of, 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 of execution is small. The number of execution is actually huge, and it's an event-driven program. So I can show you that even in a small program, 
I can create many, many events. So that's why you are actually explaining why it's very difficult for tools like Mitril to find bugs because they're essentially doing what you are saying. Okay, that makes yeah. sense then. There seems to be two parts to what you're doing. One is the mapping of the code to algebraic formulas. And the other one is understanding the space of possible constraints to hold those formulas too, so that you can you can test to make to see if how it how it operates, how, how that mapping of code to math works, and if it whether or not it breaks one of those constraints that you you hold to be true. So like one like how like is is that basically what the academic science is 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 understanding how to map the EVM and salinity baby. I'm not sure exactly where you're doing that mapping to uh, to algebra, and then like. How are you like you're just building a corpus of constraints of like things that shouldn't happen in various scenarios? So so the so the constraints we are not actually building a corpus of constraints. What we are building, we are building a tool, if you can think about it like a compiler, that from your program it generates a unique set of constraints for your program. So if you think of our tool very similar to a compiler. The compiler takes your source code and generates a, a executable or bytecode. So what we do, we take, we operate at the EVM level at the moment. So we take the EVM, we map the semantic of the EVM instruction into constraint. But if your program has more instruction, we map it to the constraint. Now, with respect to the question, what is interesting scientifically, there, there are a lot of things which are interesting scientifically. The, the most interesting, of course, writing high level specification. As you pointed out, we want to make sure that we can write high level specification. So then we need to, First, provide a mechanism to do it, and second, show that the constraint can solve these these things. I should say we are building on a lot of things that were done in the community, including like the Microsoft tool called Z3, and there's uh, Stanford University has the tool. So uh, we are using a lot of open source software in the tool. It's actually a tool chain. Okay, so <clears throat> the you're not releasing this live because you're afraid of the impact it will have on the Ethereum ecosystem. And he's running a business. However, let's let's. It's running a business. Well, like that's that's okay. okay that has to be yeah, part yeah. of it, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. But but exactly. We have more profit. Yeah. The argument is it's a it's a weapon if used proper improperly, right? Meaning that if 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 you do if you volunteer this, what you've also done is basically said that a lot of these smart contracts out there are vulnerable. A lot of big ones, for instance, Maker was vetted. Very hard, very hard. And it went through security audits and it is vulnerable. It was vulnerable. And like you found that and they didn't and it could have caused problems. And if there's, if there's, if there's one maker, there's others that are, that are already deployed and have this problem. If there's one problem out there, you're seeing, you're seeing that this is probably a common thread amongst all Ethereum smart contracts. Can I verify that that's something you're seeing? Ah uh, yes, yes, definitely. Oh, I should say, yeah, I should say the maker team is really care about security. They fix this bug before it's deployed, and I think everybody that we we one of the nice thing about this domain, we I used to work in formal verification before, and you come to people and you report bug, and they say we have too many bugs to fix, and <laughs> and here when when you are reporting a bug, people are serious. They are they take us very seriously. Oh, they, it's money. They talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that so I think everybody that we report so far, we we have a, a responsible bug disclosure policy, and we're actually one of the ways that we acquire customers by reporting bugs. That's very clear. That's great. Uh, I'm looking at I'm looking at the demo now because uh, it piqued my curiosity after Colin said something. It looks as though um, the spec is similar to something like TLA. Uh, which is like a, a formal specification writing language against some some piece of code. Um, is that like, did you pull from, like where did you pull from the spec language that's being used? How do people learn how to write these types of things? Like it, it's very interesting to like write a, write, write a smart contract language, write a smart contract in Solidity, but I think it's even more interesting to write what a smart contract should be doing in a, in, a, in, a, in a tailored specification language? How can people get access to this and is it useful for them to start doing that? 
Yes, so the, the language is completely open source and the specification you can change and we, we will release it. And I should acknowledge our customer, specifically Compound, Finance and, 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 and Coinbase. Actually, they came with the spec, so they are helping us. And you are absolutely right. This goes back to TLA and even earlier VDM. There are a lot of work. So we are, we are taking things from the community. The, the thing that we are doing, we are trying to make sure that the, there is a match between what we can specify and what we can check. So that, so TLA is, is actually more expressive than what we are supporting mm-hmm. at the moment because we don't know how to check it because we don't want the case that you come now and write a spec and then our tool doesn't work and you complain. Yeah. So, so we are, we are, and, and, and we are, and we are, of course, making progress as much as we can and we are adding more things to the spec. We plan to add many more things to the spec in the next coming months. All right, so walk but me through this. I'm sorry, go ahead. Continue. Sorry? I'm sorry, continue. But the spec is completely open. Also, in the even if you see in the demo, you can change the spec. We only want, we, the only thing which is not open is the ability to, to run on other people's code. Okay. So I guess, um, walk me through this. Uh, I have, like, I, I, I'm a smart contract developer. I have something that's relatively complex. It's not your standard ERC-20 token, right? It's, it's something that does something novel, and I, and I want to make sure that how I think it works, works. How do I go about doing that using Sertora? What does your code do? Can you elaborate a little bit? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm making a hypothetical. Like, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a project cool? developer, oh. and I built something. How do I engage Sertora? Do I have to go through you? Can I start, can I go somewhere else to learn how to maybe use a subset of Sertora? Like, what can I do right today to start checking the things that I'm building as a smart contract developer? So far today, maybe in the future, it's it's SUAS. So basically, you engage with us, we you you get a, you you sign a contract with us and you just run the tool or and you check it. And we help you, of course, we give you support. We can review your spec. We, of course, if there's, there are bugs in our tool, which of course happens, we fix them. So it's also us at the moment, but we can uh, imagine situation in the future that everybody could just download it and use it. Nice. Uh, it's, what, so, go ahead, Colin. The, the problem with formal verification though, and I, I think this is, is that it is not a problem. It's just, it just is what it is. You know, you have to think of the edge cases in order to define define the verification standard for the system. Now, what you what I like about what you've done is a lot of this stuff seems a little more modularized. So you can take bits of this from there and that from there, and and those constraints would pretty much copy over pretty, fairly easy into different programs. But formal verification doesn't verify unless your spec is good enough to to actually catch what you're looking for, and so. That, that way of thinking isn't necessarily a common feature amongst most programmers or people in general. And those little edge cases could easily be missed. Is this what you bring to the table in, in terms of this? You help find those, 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 those things that they need to verify that they're not thinking about and ask the right questions? So, so I don't know if I can show slides in this, but actually I have examples. And I think the way we teach people to think about it is not to, to look for edge cases to look for high-level properties. Like, for example, the property that we use that we got from Coinbase is no unbounded minting. So the tool finds the edge cases. We don't. That's another difference. We don't find the, We don't advocate people to write the edge cases. You write the spec. Uh, maybe, I don't know if I can show. Do you want me to show something? We don't record videos. It's only audio. So. Okay, that's fine. But we, you can see, for example, in the report that, that Compound put, so, for example, they had this property that they said that any loan that somebody can take, it can be repaid. That they came with this property, and then the tool find out the situation that this is not the case. So they are not thinking of the edge cases. They are thinking of the positive cases. They are thinking of what it's supposed to guarantee. Look even in the invertible contract. You say that you it's inverted, and then the situation. So you are not looking for edge cases. That's not what we want to do. We want you to say what's the required behavior. So, and it's a very big difference because there are many more uh, edge cases that we can think of. Yeah. There's no way that we can teach you to 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 work on edge cases. This is common. So I, apologize. I apologize because I used the wrong word there. Definitely, de- you're absolutely correct. 
when we're talking about edge cases, you're talking about validation, not verification. And that's a very different, different thing. And I, I apologize. It was definitely not correct. Um, but even then, thinking of all the high level specifications for a program that you've already written is, is some, is, is very, is not always intuitive. Uh, yeah. Correct. It's, it's not even intuitive to us sometimes. It's very interesting. It's, uh, we ask ourselves, who do we have to talk in the organization? And sometimes it's not actually the developer. It's very interesting. Sometimes we get these properties for somebody else say, look, this is what's like the security manager say, this is what I have to check. So you are absolutely right. Sometimes actually we get this property for somebody who even didn't develop the code. And, and it's, it actually is somebody who's very close to the code. You ask a programmer that assigned X to two. What's true? It tells you X is equal to two. <laughs> he's very, very concrete. And, and he's absolutely right, but it's not useful. It's not going to find a bug. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our sponsor of the show this week, Status. And today I want to call out uh, the many listeners who are building dApps on Ethereum to tell you how to get your dApp in the hands of all the Status app users. Status app itself is a mobile web 3, lets you chat, browse, and transact. There's a lot of cool things about the Status app. Right now, let's talk about the Dapp Explorer. Status app uses DAP.PS, that's referred to as dApps, as an on-ramp to use Ethereum dApps on mobile. Maybe you've heard about DeFi, want to check out KyberSwap or DeFi Zap. We'll get some S and T and F, load it up in your status wallet, and use dap.ps, DAP.ps, to get DeFi on mobile. Take your decentralized permissionless finance with you. Already we're seeing tons of excitement around mobile DAPs in Web3. If you've got a DAP, head to DAP.ps, check it out, follow the instructions for staking, and get your DAP ranked and featured, or email stake at DAP.ps for more information. What's really neat about the Status App Dapp Explorer is that it automatically creates a social channel for your Dapp. So you've got a place where Status App users can find and use your Dapp, but also you've got the built-in private and secure chat functionality to build a community, do Q&A, FAQ, support, or even meme building. What's that you say? You're not a Dapp developer? Why not? Status has a suite of developer tools to get you started building, testing, and deploying Web3 Dapps with Embark.io. You know, you see projects that raised a bunch of money in their ICO in 2017, and then nothing. Some crappy wallet, maybe some marketing partnerships, but Status is shipping consumer products, dev tools, and fixing Ethereum and basic peer-to-peer -peer networking and communication protocols. The team is legit. I'm on it. Decentralized and open source. Check out everything they're up to at thestatusnetwork.com or start with the Status app at statusim slash git. That's status.im slash get. Back to the show. Yeah, that's the thing that I think that I, I may be missing in the development process and a lot of this stuff is um, before starting even writing code, I feel as though you should be writing like these are the things it should do and nothing else. Like these are the bounds this variable should ever have. This thing should never go over this. This thing should always be equal to this at this point, so on and so forth. And usually that comes... Um, through in the smart contracting language, uh, like in solidity in the form of like asserts and requires, right? Whenever you hit some part of a code that's like, okay, at this point, let's require this is equal to this, or let's assert that this is equal to this, so on and so forth. And that then uh, makes sure that the contract, if not, if hits some type of valid state, will, will stop and the transaction will be invalid. Um, from what I can tell, based on looking through your documentation, you have a similar type of statement to put into like solidity smart contracts that um, your you know compiler can read and to make and these become what's what's known as constraints. Like in, in the mathematical world, this is a constraint. Um, in the developer world, it's just like an assertment or requirement or whatever. And so, like, how is 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 ensure in addition to what developers are currently using for a certain require, or is it something that's specific to yours? Or you're trying to move it into what is it? So, so we are trying to make this tool look as, 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 as much as possible close to Solidity because we think it's a good idea because it's a tool for Solidity developer. And we are trying to make a spec almost look like a unit test. So basically the idea is you write a, a requirement, but of course, to get the big value from that, the requirement that you have to write are requirements that really capture the high level properties of your code. Like I told you this example with, with Coinbase or Compound, you have an example that specifies something very high level of your code, and then this tool is useful. And and uh, and uh, 
there are also some generic properties that we can check on the spot, like for example, uh, absence of reentrancy attack. But the big value of that is coming for high level specification. The ability to say something about the code, which is important. For example, you have sufficient number of reserves. These are high level properties. And some of them, by the way, are properties that we are adding now that you cannot even write with a set. For example, you want to reason about, I don't know how technical you want me to talk about, but you want to reason about unbounded things like unbounded uh, unbounded operations, and then you cannot write it with a set, but we can still write it in, in our specification language, which is called specify. Yeah, so basically, like, uh, to, to make that clear, it's like, yeah, there's a certain and requires inside solidity, but they're, they're specific to the function in solidity. And this, you're creating a set of rules for the state, the state of the entire system. And, and, and the state of the entire system has to abide by these particular rules, no matter what function is called. No matter what, you know, you cannot, for instance, have um, zero as a uh, receiving address. Like, this should never happen in the state of this of this system that you're you're writing the rules for. And if any at any time you find that you've you've done that, you've violated that rule for the overall state, then you throw an error and you say, hey, this is actually where that error came from. This particular function violates this particular rule. It won't even necessarily tell you where I I, I don't know that actually because when I click the 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 the, the branching logic button, uh, it uh it it goes to a four or four page right now. But um, you know, assuming that there's a dump of some sort, you might be able to trace back. But the 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 actual um, the actual bug is identified down to the function level um, because it violates the overall rules of the entire smart contract and the system that it, it interacts with. So the question I have now is, how does this handle multi-contract situations where one contract invokes another contract or uses another contract as a library? Does it apply the rule set? For that smart contract against the library or the singleton that's out there, um, how does this work right now? So you could actually, you, so the, the, the mechanism that we are trying to enforce here is modularity. The idea is that each of these codes is supposed to be correct with respect to arbitrary environment. So that gives us a high coverage, but sometimes it may require you to specify some kind of things about the connection between these things. So basically, this allows this tool to, to basically run on each contract separately, but you are making a worst case assumption. That's another advantage because we don't run this on all passes. We can symbolically, if you have a contract A that calls contract B, we don't need to run contract B. We can assume that B does the, the worst thing possible and then run this thing. So in fact, we, we can actually give you a very, very high assurance. So we can... So if you have a multiple, and in fact, some of the bugs that we are finding are bugs like this, that we are finding bugs that actually, not because something is wrong in your contract, is something is wrong in the contract that you are calling. And then as a result of it, you get this bad behavior. Good old parody multi-sig type stuff, huh? You know, exactly. like what they did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, well the, so if we can, if we can know that B, which is in, uh, A invokes B, and we know that B is doing what B is intended, all we have to do is make sure the state of A obeys its rules, and we're in it. In it it's transitive, I guess. We just know that that A is correct because B is correct, and A's assumptions assume that a, a correct B. Correct, exactly. But for example, if you don't you didn't write anything about B, then our tool will assume that B can do arbitrary thing. So we, and and you didn't check, but we, actually we do give you a trace of the error. But the trace that we are giving. It would not be a real trace if we didn't know what B is doing because we, we are doing what is called in, in, in computer science over approximation. When we don't know nothing, we actually take the safe side, so we actually take all behaviors. Ah, oh, that's nice to know. So that basically is saying, like, we don't know enough about this, so we're going to assume the worst. Um, exactly. We're going we're gonna to explore we, the we, bounds of what this thing could possibly do and see if it if it works inside of A. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, how okay? I guess where I'd like to maybe take this from here, because it's it's all fascinating and awesome. But there's there has to be um, limits to what's currently going on, right? How does this scale? Um, where where does it meet issues? Is it does it have to do with code complexity? Does it have to do with size? Does it have to do with the number of constraints? Like, um, where are you finding difficulty to like working or making this tool work? So code complexity is definitely an issue. Uh, uh, I think that 
They are, it's not just the size of the code, it's what's in the code. So, for example, things like nonlinear arithmetic, there are some things that in the code that makes verification much harder. So if your, if your code implements a linear arithmetic, it's easier. But you, uh, if your code uh, implements nonlinear arithmetic, it will be harder. Another quick case where things are interesting is when you have loops, when your program loops over multiple things. So we need to learn something which is called invariant. So there are a lot of interesting challenges which are, still need to be addressed in the tool. Yeah, and sort of some of the talks I've seen on, on formal verification, actually it was a K talk, um, uh, it's because Solidity is still a Turing complete language, it makes it very difficult to formally verify it. Um, do you do you agree with that assessment or is that something that uh, maybe I, I just misunderstood about how difficult it is to actually do formal verification on any Turing complete language? So that's a very interesting question. Uh... I, I'm not sure I agree. I mean, in general, it is true that Turing complete language are very hard, but it doesn't mean if you have a single program, because the, the problem as we find, find out, it's not just coming from the programming language, it's also coming from the specification language. And to, 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 have, to have, in order to have the ability to write high level specification, you need powerful specification language too. So it's true that it's, it's a Turing complete language, but we we want to make it sure that it works for our customer. We don't need to work on arbitrary program. We need to make sure that it's running on the program that are there. And 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 we are handling actually pretty complex uh, EVM code. I don't know that if you push move it to SQL, you're going to make our life very easy. And SQL is not a doing complete language. Right. I mean, so. Compound Actually, and SQL maker is. are complex. ANSI, ANSI <laughs> SQL is Turing complete, isn't it? I, I've always read that it was. What? ANSI SQL is Turing complete. ANSI standard yeah. SQL is, is Turing yeah. complete. Anyway, um, yeah. anyway uh, I'm, I'm kind of um, curious. Uh, so like, um, what are they called? Meta, meta transactions? Um, they have a signature verification component in them. Um, I believe that's in the smart contract. Would that sort of, sort of stuff break with this formal verification, or is this that's not the kind of math you're talking about here? So, so what what are you talking specifically? Uh, so you actually, I believe, maybe I'm misunderstanding this. Corey would probably Corey has a memory I don't, so he would probably remember better than me. But um, meta transactions, I think they actually try and do signature verification in the smart contract itself. Um, these kind of complex maths you're saying would actually break. Um, formal verification or not. So meta transaction would be like a gasless transaction. So um, there's a bunch of people ready to, to put them in the, and you, you send a smart con, you send a, um, a signature to a third party who acts as a proxy. There's a proxy contract on the chain and the proxy contract is what does the verification of the signature uh for a third party who would just aggregate all the exchanges, state changes. On-chain cryptography. It's a, yeah, it's on-chain this, cryptography. This, this on-chain cryptography, on chain, cryptography on chain, right? trip tool, yes. Yeah. So we, we have a customer actually in this space. No, I don't think it's so bad. The question is, for formal verification always, you have to know what you are verifying. We're not verifying the off-chain cryptography. We are verifying the, 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 the code that people write. We, we, we don't give them, we give them guarantee about the correctness of their code. So actually, the, we are, we are working with customers like this. I don't think that it will, I mean, actually, the, the, the thing that we, we are making, we are finding ways around actually a lot of the difficult problems of, of uh, formal verification, but it has to do with the complexity of the code, of course. I guess the I guess the main difficulty with most of like what you would refer to as on chain cryptography is like hash functions, right? Um, they're very difficult to approximate or, or um, map, uh, at least within a lot of the verification tools because because of the space it has to search. But maybe al like algebraically, it's a different so, story. So, so exactly. So hashing is a beautiful example because it's not very difficult for us because what we assume we assume that there are no hash collision, but we never we never explicitly enumerate it. So we work, I don't know how complex you want to do, but we work in first order logic. I don't know if you are you are familiar with this or no. No, can you give us a brief explanation? So that's, you think about something like SQL, where basically your word is a relation. 
and, and, and we map everything to this relation, and then we have the ability to write quantifiers, like when we write that something is true for all elements. And in fact, for hashing and all of these things, we actually can reason about them in a reasonable way. We are not finding, of course, bugs of hash collision, because we are finding bugs in your code. We are not looking for bugs in hash collision. We are just need to make sure that the tool doesn't produce an error which actually come from a, from potential hash collision because the tool doesn't know about hash collision. Ah, so, so that's why so, you said um, you have difficulties with like nonlinear math. And so I would imagine things like zero knowledge, um, it's like the kind of the, the ZK circuits that are put into um, Ethereum are, are rather relatively difficult based on their nonlinearity. No, no, so that's the idea. Again. You just Sorry? don't well, don't look at it. Like that's the thing. You just assume true and assume exactly. there's nothing wrong with it, and then you do everything else. And the if you say, "Hey, look, here's the deal. This is true." Okay, come on. This is my zk saying. Like I have to at least assume that this is true. Um, that this this one function this does this, this zk star group validation or whatever. It, it literally it literally has to be true. And if it's not, this whole program breaks anyway. So we're just gonna assume this is true and we're skip past that. And we're just going to go on to the state. We'll make sure that none of my state is violated in any weird way as a result of this being true. Same with hash collision. Same with signature verification. You just go, uh, yeah, that, that, part's, that part's good. Um, but everything else that is really customizable, like most people are just going to copy and paste this part anyway, the, the ZK start, start part, and like the signature verification stuff. But anything that's like having to do with your specific business logic and your specific program, and a lot of it, it sounds like you're actually going straight to the business people to get the business logic of the smart contract. Right. And then you program, you program a specification around that. It's literally a specification. Like it's literally when somebody hands you a specification document from a, from a contract and says, this is what I want you to build. You could literally one-to-one -one take that specification into uh, plus probably a few things they left out and put it into a, an actual spec doc. It looks like, and then some programmer could run, write a code. You could compare it against that actual spec doc and make sure that it's correct. So you don't have to worry about ZK Snarks because guess what? That spec doc from the business guy, you don't give a shit about that. Actually, it's interesting that one of the things that we are, you're absolutely right, but one of the things that we are finding even with this other code, we can still find bugs of interface mismatch because what happened, you have this ZK, but then you are using it and you are doing this cut and paste, but actually you are not doing it right. You have two things with the same address pointing to the same thing and then you get into trouble. So there's a problem not just in the cryptography, but also how the cryptography is realized in programs. And, and it's true, we are not looking for bugs in the fact that somebody didn't get the right polynom for the, for the, for the thing. But we are, we are finding cases where this polynom, where it's translated, it will, it will have an error. So that's actually what we are looking for. We are looking for programming errors. That's, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm kind of curious, like, What's next? What's on what's on the horizon in the near future for 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 y'all to kind of implement, start introducing to people and using? So so the making this tool much more robust and much more automatic and, and making the the, uh, the ability to of people to, to write high level spec. Because we think that the more high level spec that they can write, uh, uh this will make our world a better place. Oh I would so, and it will make as a security engineer, I could not agree more. <laughs> Having people write specs for what they're doing would make my life a, a way easier than it currently is. Uh, like how do people learn how to do that? How do you teach people to start writing specs? Where do they go? So that's a, an excellent question. We actually have a wonderful uh, experience with some of our customers. Again, I'm point out compound finance, their engineer are doing so well, they're finding uh, bugs in our tool, but they're finding also bugs in their code with this. So so that's very, very useful. I think the way we want to do, we want to do like webinars, we want to teach people. I started and we, we do it, we have together with me, we have many people who are excellent uh, educators, including James Wilcox, who is uh, graduated from the University of Washington. So he's gonna give a, a number of workshops in the US, and we're going to give many, many workshops, and we are interested to, to give a webinar to, to allow people to write spec. And we make, as I said, we make the spec open source. We do everything which is possible to, to allow people to write spec. Could someone who's not using uh, Yale's product 
benefit from the spec that would be used inside of your product. Like if they say, for instance, um, I wanted to use your tool, I wrote a spec for my project and used your tool against it, but I also wanted an additional third-party audit. Could I, like, would it be beneficial to them if I took that same spec and brought it to them for the audit? I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. And, uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure the answer is yes, that the auditor could use this spec. Also, you, you can, tools like Meet, we can use this spec. So we think that this spec will be good contribution to the ecosystem. Even if you want to use like K, I mean, the specification is, is the property which is important in your code. So we think that this would be useful. You can also use it for just one-time checking. You can just insert, when you have the specification, you can just check that your code satisfy the properties while it is executed. I guess the obvious, I guess what, what my, my mind is turning here, um, how easy it to is it to auto-generate a spec using maybe development tooling and IDEs to say like they, they, you, you write your code, it then generates a spec based on certain things that you're writing inside of it, maybe pragmas maybe. We don't have enough experience to answer. We are we are we are seeing the cases that a, a, a developer writes a code and wrote a spec, and later on when when the developer changes the code, we want to make sure that the spec remains the same. So this is a case that we can help usually. We can have an IDE that help you update the spec when you when you updated your code because the change in the spec is either nothing or very simple, it's like you change the function, or, but auto generating specification is not what we are doing at the moment. We are, we are, we are helping programmers, for example, we are thinking when you have a loop, then we can generate environment, but the high level specification is not what we are doing at the moment. It is something that you write by hand. Okay. Yeah. And, and like, say you have the spec already, although I'm not even sure what the development process would be. So for me, I think it would be easier to write the code first and then write the spec. Um, but I could see maybe possibly being presented with a spec first and then writing the code. Either way, when you're editing the code, if it violates the spec, it should just give you this big old alert. Hey, man, you're violating your own spec. And then you could either change the spec or you could change your code. But one of them's got to change. And like I could see an IDE interaction like that where it becomes very easy to, from a, from a product sense, to actually like develop better uh, iterations over your own code and then also integrate this into... Um, you know, um, continuous integration pipelines and stuff like that. Uh, but I'm really actually curious when you write these specs, do you do it after you've written the code or do you do it before you've written the code? What is your, what is your typical methodology method for, for producing this? Cause I can't see them. I can, I can't see myself doing them at the same time, but I can see a scenario where I might do one or the other first. I will answer it, but let me go back and tell you what we do with spec, which is very useful. And we started doing it in the tool. We check that the code adheres to the spec, but we also check that the spec makes sense. Because what happens is when you are writing a spec, we do have mistakes in the spec, not just in the code. So, for example, if your spec could be vacuously hold, like you write a spec because this program actually doesn't reach. So that's Actually, just a mistake in the spec, and you can make mistakes in the spec. The specs are, we are all human. So we, we do check spec, and we plan to do more checks for the spec. Now, the, 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 the other question that you have about, about the, the ecosystem. So, so it's interesting. We don't know. We, we have to see how we, I mean, how, how we develop this tool. I mean, there, there are actually already works that people, have what they have, for example, from a specification, in some the generate case, we can actually generate the code. We can do the, the opposite is sometimes easier for us. When you have a specification, if it's simple enough, we can we can generate the code from the spec. And that's useful, again, even to see what the spec is. Oh, then that gives you, I guess that informs the, the order in which you do these things because um it's easier to potentially generate code from a spec than it is to generate a spec from code. Uh, right. So it should inform the order in which you should be doing these things, like logically. Uh, but in practice, that never happens. What about you guys? Right. You guys who are building this tool, do you typically write specs first or do you even write code? We write tons of code, of course. <laughs> but I don't know. 
<laughs> but I'm not sure that we write so much spec, unfortunately. Our code is not, <laughs> yeah, our code is, is written in a programming language like Kotlin, like many others, but the, 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 uh, you're absolutely right. You, you, I think the, the answer is probably some and some. When we engage with customer, we ask them to write spec first, and they usually write spec in English, okay? And if they are willing to write it in, in mathematical, we either help them or, or they, they write it in our language. But sometimes we also write specification after the code. And, and another thing that we can see, and this is help, happening to us again and again, that actually we can give them specification that we develop for other customer, provided that the other customer agree. So basically, we the fact that you develop a decentralized finance application, and now you come to us, we can actually run it and check because the specification is not actually checking something specific for your code. The specification is checking a high-level property like this, this uh, invertibility or bounded minting or some property which is high-level. It's not specific to this DeFi. So we can run your code and check that it adheres to this spec. Awesome. I got, I got a, uh, we're running out of time here and I don't want, I could, I could drag this on for a lot longer, but um, are there any questions that uh, you wish I would have asked during this that I didn't? Uh, no, I think you cover, uh, you covered it all. Thank you very I'm, much. I'm curious, like when you compare yourself to other, other existing solutions, what was, what was the thing that jumped out that you were like, they're doing it wrong and I can do this right. What was, what was the things that you don't like? And you don't have to name anybody. Like what, specific, what specific things did you go, ah, you know, I, I, I know that they're not doing this this way they're doing it. I don't like. No, no, I don't think it's the case. I should acknowledge that there are actually projects that are doing very similar things to us. They're just doing it at the academic level. So there's a project by Microsoft called Verisol. So there's, we are, we are doing things which are similar. I think we, of course, since we are a for-profit company, it's, uh, we are doing it in a different way. But what we are doing is something similar that I don't know if you guys know. It's called deductive verification. It's not like K, but it's another approach. But there are tools like Microsoft had an early tool called Daphne. We had our own tool we developed for research, which is called IV. There, and these are all open source, uh, including ours before. But I think the reason that it get us interesting, got me interesting, is actually, of course, the enthusiasm of Shelly and the, the group actually that we have, but also the fact that it's uh, what what Corey said, that in fact it's a domain which is an excellent for formal verification. And in fact, I am we are solving in the daily life, we are solving research problem in Boston. So there's a research problem, and I could elaborate if we go on another call, but we for us it derives our research. And it's actually... We can. We are developing new algorithms. We are developing new techniques. So it it derives research. So it we, we it's the it's mainly the application that got us very interested. Yeah, I can see that. Like going th through client engagements, you can see specific types of problems that many people are reaching, which informs you what the best research topic could be in terms of solving real applicable problems today. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, oh, that's outstanding. So um, thanks for coming on the show. I, I really enjoyed this and I look forward to um, hearing more about uh, what you guys are doing and, and potentially engaging uh, the software. Thank you very much. And thank you for, uh, thank you very much for the interview. Yeah, thank you, Molly. That was great. Thanks a lot. Bye. <laughs>